Hi, my name is Shadow Temple, and in this video we're going to talk about making asynchronous calls in JavaScript using async await. We're going to explore the syntax and its benefits, we're going to compare it with other ways of making asynchronous requests, and we're going to see how to use it today with the help of a compiler. So let's get started. So what is async await? There are a couple of keywords that used together will help us write asynchronous requests in a more elegant way. An async call is what is also usually called an AJAX call. In a few words, what that means is, when we start an async call, a request will be made to the server. During the time the server will take to process that request, the browser is free to do other things, like render text, execute some more JavaScript, animations, and so on. When the response is received from the server, the code that started the request will continue to execute from the same point where it started. Async functions will help us write those requests, with less code and in a more readable way. So that code written using async functions will look and feel as it is synchronous code. The easiest way to see the benefits of async functions is by comparing them to some more traditional ways of making async requests. In this video, I will present you two ways of making async calls, one using callbacks and another one using promises. I will point out some issues with those approaches and then present you with what async functions bring to the table that allows us to write better code today. Here we have some jQuery code that makes an async request to some API that will return a JSON as a response. jQuery is still today a heavily used library to do many things and among those to make async calls or AJAX calls as we used to say. In this example, we have a findMove function that takes two arguments, a title and a callback function. We'll use the title to make a request to find a movie, and when the response comes back, we'll call the callback function and pass in the movie object received in the response. Next, we have a loadInitialData function that will call the findMovie and will present the data in the page. What is the problem with this code? Well, it's the way the code reads that's unnatural and may cause confusion. Because we start here calling the load initial data function. Then, inside it, we call the find move function. When we get there, we use jQuery to make an async call, which means the browser will be free to do any other thing it has to do. And when the request is completed, we'll get back to this point where we can call the callback function with the data. Finally, we're back to the function that is responsible to present the data. Keep in mind that this is a very simple example, and yet it's not as simple to read. Imagine if we needed to make another async call after completing the first one. We could have nested async calls, or what's also known as callback hell. Now, in 2015, promises became part of JavaScript, and although we could use promises with the jQuery, jQuery does not implement promises in the way it's defined by the language. So to demonstrate the use of promises, I'll be using the fetch API. Don't worry if you don't know what the fetch API is. The important is that it uses promises and that it makes async requests. Here's the same code as before, but using promises and the fetch API. Walking through this code, we can see that again, we start calling the load initial data function, but this time we only pass the title of the movie we're looking for. In the find move function, we use fetch. This function will start an async call that will immediately return a promise, so that the browser is free to do other things. When the promise is fulfilled, all of the methods will be called in sequence. First, we have a response object that is received. That's how the fetch API works, so we don't worry about it too much. The important thing is that the response object has a JSON method that will return the data we expect in a JSON format. Next, we have another then method that will receive the movie object and simply return it. Then, we are back to the starting point where we receive the movie object return and we can display it in the page. As you can see, the flow is also a bit messy, because even though we have this line of code here to handle the promise, it is defining an anonymous function that will only be called when the promise is fulfilled. But the problem of nested callbacks is solved by the use of promises, because we can have as many of those then methods as we'd like, and they would be executed in the sequence we write them. Now, before we see an example of an async function, we have to know that to use async functions today, we need to compile them. 
That's because async functions are not yet supported by browsers, but with the help of a compiler, we transform async functions into code that browsers can understand. Async functions are not yet officially part of JavaScript, but is a feature that is in process of becoming part of the language. But even when it becomes part of JavaScript, it will take some time before browsers implement it. So, I'll be using Babel to compile the code. Babel is free and widely adopted by the community. I'll start by demonstrating how to set up Babel. What I have here is a package.json file that shows the minimum needed to use Babel to compile code that uses async functions. In the dev dependencies, we have four packages, Babel CLI, that I'll be using to fire the compilation process. I'll be doing that manually to keep this video simple. But in production, you might want to use something such as Gulp, Grunt, or Webpack. Next, there's Babel Core and two presets. The ES2015 preset has what's needed to compile the JavaScript features added in 2015, and the Stage 3 has what's needed to compile features that are in this stage and in the process of being part of the language. Async functions are on Stage 3. In the dependency sections, we have jQuery, used for the previous demo, and Babel Polyfill that's needed to run async functions compiled by Babel on the browser. The last part I want to show you is that I added a build script to help me start the compilation by using Babel CLI. Now, let's go on and see how an async function works. First, to create an async function, we have to add the async keyword when declaring the function. This will allow us to await for another function. We can only use the await keyword in a function that was declared using the async keyword, and we can only await for a function that will return a promise which is the case of the findMove function. This code and the previous example using only promises work exactly the same way, but here we can see that this code is a lot more readable. The movie object is immediately available right after its declaration. That's because it's as if the await keyword would pause the execution and continue only when the promise is fulfilled. The result is a code that looks and reads as it was synchronous. If, for instance, we needed to make another call to find another movie, we could just duplicate the line that calls the findMove function. Both objects, movie and movie2, will be immediately available after the call to the findMove function. And that's all that takes to use async functions. To recap, we need to add the async keyword when declaring the function. Then we add the await keyword when calling a function that returns a prompt, and the value return is immediately available. Is this the perfect solution? Well, we still have some cons when using async functions, such as the compilation process and the need for a polyfill such as the Babel polyfill in the client. On the other hand, with the addition of only two new keywords, we have a code that is cleaner, it's easier to understand, and it reads as a single flow. I hope this video has helped you. Thanks for watching.